He was a perfect engineer. He had worked with Fazlur Khan on the Sears Tower in Chicago. We needed somebody who had experience with high rise buildings. But he also had done retrofits. He did the Palace Hotel and the Ninth Circuit Court. So he was a rare engineer who understood at a large scale new and old structural techniques. I remember first meeting him and I said, well, what do you think working for another structural engineer? He was a little nervous about that. And I said something stupid like, how about I write the music and you play the song? And the way it really turned out is I barely wrote a note and uh, he played a symphony. Uh, building this, as I will show you in a minute, was extremely difficult uh, for a number of reasons. And the contractor plan construction was fantastic. And the shoring engineer, technical, did a marvelous job just keeping the bones uh, up uh, during the course of construction. This is a talk that I gave to the Ritz-Carlton Sales and Construction Division a couple months before the building was completed. They wanted to understand, really, <coughs> they heard that there's an amazing story behind the building and wanted to know more about it. This is the original Chronicle building, built in 1890. It was the tallest building west of the Mississippi, designed by Daniel Burnham. Uh, Michael B. Young, this is the second Chronicle building, actually. Uh, <coughs> you who are historians of newspapers know that the Barbary Coast era of San Francisco was a little rough, that the Youngs weren't particularly beloved. In fact, his brother Charles was assassinated before this building was built. Uh, this building purportedly had the largest clock in the world. Uh, there's also a rumor that it was knocked off during the earthquake. That's untrue. The building, uh, the, the clock came off uh, during a parade in 1903. There was a labor movement parade and a rocket was shot from one of the floats. Uh, a flaming rocket hit the uh, <laughs> tower. <laughs> and it burned off. <laughs> this corner, right, in fact, this spot couldn't have been picked more perfectly. This corner right here was historically known as Newspaper Angle. The Hearst building across the street, the Chronicle building here, and the call bulletin diagonal across the street. And the three owners of those properties were kind of in a competition to build the biggest and greatest and first skyscraper in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, the Young one, uh, the building the first uh, uh, building, uh, Spreckles actually built a taller building, but it got a concrete jacket in the 30s and it's still there. And Hearst, of course, uh, that building is still building systems and pretty much uh, uh, untouched. And ultimately, what I will tell you in a little bit, first sort of won the, the, the race. Um, the build, because the building was clad, it had no official historic permits. It was clad before historic preservation movements really started, before laws that the city has uh, governing the preservation were put on the books. Um, these red dots are, happen to be buildings that we've worked on in the central core of San Francisco. But this building is just outside of the building conservation district. And again, it's, it, even though it's one of the most incredible landmarks in the city, was, was not rated. Now, this gave us some technical advantage to be able to do the modifications that were necessary to actually pull this off. And here's a picture of the building um, when it was uh, finished. Take, concentrate a little bit on the arch, the main arch, which um, is still uh, in existence. I'm going to show you what's underneath that arch. In a Earthquakes were not unknown before 1906. In fact, there was an earthquake in 1837 and one in 1862, I believe. And this is a plan of the original building that shows diagonal braces that uh, were put in to resist earthquakes. One great piece of uh, luck we uh, encountered was this broadside. When the building was um, launched, the uh, Chronicle published this uh, article about it. And not only did it talk about the features of the building, but it said where all the materials came from, how much they weighed, how much they cost, and who was involved. Wow. Uh, like all old buildings, it, of course, didn't meet modern codes. It had one fire spare. It had one bathroom. <laughs> it had a number of uh, water closets in the bathroom, but it was a men's room. Uh, it had a dynamo in the basement to generate its own electricity. Uh, and, and you just think a building that had that level of technology is uh, we're, we're standing right now. Mm -hmm. We didn't find these horizontal braces. Mm -hmm. And in 1906, the building was damaged uh, quite heavily, uh, especially at the corner. In fact, right here, right under, in fact, right here. <laughs> 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 the, uh, the typesetting department for the Chronicle was at the top story because of the leading 
natural light and type very heavy uh, living material. In fact, my father was a lighter type operator, so um, that kind of history uh, sort of resonated with, uh, with me. Very, very heavy stuff, and that, of course, you know, pulled the corner of the building down during the uh, 1906 earthquake. A number of other reasons uh, uh, contributed to that problem as well. Right before the earthquake, or excuse me, just about the same time, a tower was added by Willis Polk uh, on the side. Um, uh, according to legend, this building was put back in service faster than any other large building in San Francisco. And the picture on the right is one of the pictures that was hanging on the wall of the building engineer's office that I mentioned before. It's a picture just before construction was started for the cladding. You can see the hoarding down at the bottom, uh, and they were starting to do, uh, to prepare to do the work. <coughs> uh, uh, the San Francisco approval process is legendary. Uh, we had to go through that, but because we had treasure to give back to the city, in fact, we, what did we say? The architectural equivalent of raising the Titanic. Um, <laughs> We were able to, we found that the hurdles were lowered quite a bit and we were able to not get special favors or concessions, but the process, which was very long, was not as painful as it can be uh, uh, today, actually. One of the things that helped us a lot was a proposal that Willis Polk himself had made to add to the Conifer building uh, that was shown at the uh, Pan Pacific uh, Exposition. So he was adding uh, quite a bit more than the the developer was, of course, very uh, interested in this and wondered why we couldn't uh, design a building that was this tall. Uh, one of the problems, of course, was the, if you know, in the 1980s, the city was downsized, sized, uh, downsized for height. So the building height limit uh, on this site was 250 feet. Most of the buildings around us are much taller than that. This building is 315 feet, so we had to get a special zoning uh, adjustment to allow the building of this size to, to be built. A rendering uh, or a photo, so, excuse me, of the building after the cladding uh, was put on. It was done by a firm, Hagman and Meyer. Uh, we had their drawings, and in their drawings, they made reference to older drawings, so, but we didn't have. We didn't have the Burnham drawings, so we knew that somebody must have these drawings. So the firm still existed, so I called them and I talked to Mr. Uh, Tagman Jr., not knowing, of course, whether this was his dad's favorite building or not, <laughs> and just carefully probed, and we'd really like to see more information. And finally, he asked me, you know, what are you planning to do to it? He said, well, we're gonna take the skin off. And he said, oh, that would make my father really happy because he detailed this in a way so that the cladding could come off at the place. And as you'll see, he could have done, he could have done a slightly better job. <laughs> uh, I did write this book on the interaction of new and old. This is a tough design problem. Lots of different opinions on how to do it. A little bit more about that later. Our approach to this building, though, was very careful and we were very cautious. We didn't want to uh, have our new building uh, compete with the old building. Uh, the first idea, actually, that I was talked out of was to do something along the lines of the Halliday building, a glass and steel that detailed finely as almost an homage to Willis Polk, who designed that building. I was talked out of it by uh, a number of folks, and in part, because of fear of the process. I think there was concern that if we didn't do something that was masonry and feel, which with punched windows, as we call them, that um, we would have a hard time getting the, the project approved. So this was the, the design that was approved and uh, a rendering was presented to the planning commission. Our, the, the one note that I wrote structurally was uh, the black uh, hard lines on the uh, right side show concrete jackets that would be put in along the walls to knit the building together for um, uh, seismic resistance. Again, we're looking for kind of a delicate touch with the old building, but that turned out not to be sufficient. We also uh, were very careful in the restoration of the facade, followed the Secretary of the Interior's standards. The building eventually got the Mills Act um, property tax uh, reduction, um, one of the Incentives for historic preservation. So there was a lot of uh, very serious focus on making sure that the building exterior was restored in, in, in very uh, correct and proper ways. A 
original design was a, a two-story addition, a uh, little sketch I did on the right. Um, those of you who are architects have probably experienced the value of engineering, which generally sometimes takes the soul out of your design. Um, in this case, the value of engineering solution to a budget problem was to add more floors. The cost to restore the base of the building and to support it, because it was much heavier than um, a modern building, was small compared to building a new steel building once, once the foundation was already in place. What limited us, of course, was urban design uh, criteria. Um, what was the tallest building in West of Mississippi it was kind of the shortest building in this general area. So we went up as high as we thought was proper from a, just an urban design perspective, and as high as we could uh, feasibly go structurally without having a very um, complicated and expensive foundation system. Uh, Jane Turnbull coined the phrase that this was a progression of architectural styles. So the drawing on the left there, the sketch I did, but the red was the original uh, 1890 building, two and a half to three foot thick walls. That's why they use window wells or something. <coughs> Down the, building to the, the addition that Colt did on the left has about 14 inch thick walls. So in 25 or so years, we were able to go from two and a half foot thick walls to 14 inch thick walls. Our new uh, tower is uh, using a cementitious material called a GFRC glass fiber reinforced concrete. It's a half inch thick. So we technically have progressed on purpose in order to keep the weight of the new tower uh, down low. Uh, when we designed this, we thought this was the biggest uh, vertical addition to a, um, an existing building in the world. Um, it turned out that the Hearst Building in New York was built um, about the same time, and um, we're, we're just in second place to that, for sure. Uh, wind tunnel tests were done, lots of sophisticated engineering. Uh, peer reviews were done uh, of the structural design. Um, this was an uh, exceedingly uh, complex project technically, and it's a seemingly complex uh, project uh, politically, and uh, if you have any doubt about that, Jim can fill in the blanks. One of the problems was the original building really had three pieces. It had the piece that collapsed out of the 1906 earthquake that had been restored, and then the Willis Polk piece and the Daniel Burnham piece, and during an earthquake they were vibrating against each other and racking against the joint that's shown mm -hmm. on the left. Our solution was to tie everything together, so even though this is a very asymmetrical building in form and weight, it does perform during an earthquake in what we call a controlled torsion move, a uh, movement that, that kind of goes like, well, very gently, like this. <laughs> but it's designed to meet or exceed the uh, current uh, building code. Uh, it had a, another weight problem. The floors were made out of terracotta tile. <clears throat> the big concern in Vernon's day was fire. So there were lots of systems that were developed, mostly proprietary systems, to fireproof steel and to build fireproof construction. So the floors were made of, of terracotta um, bricks that were wedged in, uh, something called a jack arch. Sometimes uh, lintels are made this way. And then a concrete, a thin concrete topping put on top of that, supported by steel beams, supported by cast iron columns. The center, uh, diagram here shows what we ended up doing. Um, to uh, be eligible for the Mills Act, we uh, needed to preserve as much historic fabric as possible, and philosophically we believe that's important. But if it's dangerous, we need to remove it. Uh, we were able to convince the Landmarks Board that that was necessary in this case because in the 1906 earthquake, the corner had collapsed, and when it was rebuilt, they rebuilt it in concrete. They didn't rebuild it with tile. So we were just following the lead that was established um, historically. This is a picture of the building under construction, or demolition actually. The walls of the light well were extremely thick and heavy. So those were taken down uh, to compensate for the light weight of the new structure that was put on the inside. <coughs> because the walls were so heavy, um, they needed to, uh, they weren't, and brittle brick is heavy, but it's not very good in earthquakes. That's why they don't really buildings anymore, and we couldn't do anything to the outside, so uh, structural engineers developed a, a procedure to put a shot creek, it's kind of a spray-on concrete jacket on the inside of the building. So the picture on the left there, that's my foot looking down the slot. It goes all the way down the building, 15 stories, but then was um, uh, shot creek was uh, put in there and it was all locked together. The shot on the 
right shows the original steel beams supported by the uh, original walls uh, with new metal deck, which is replacing the top. Now, shoring this up was a real chore. In fact, there was one wing of the building we just couldn't quite get to work, so we had to cut it off. And the picture on the right is a giant saw with a blade about five feet in diameter that's making a vertical cut up 12 stories to cut off the part that we couldn't <coughs> find. The picture on the left is a shoring that was cantilevered or uh, uh, struts that were put out in diagonal ways to keep this all together um, during an earthquake, and I can show you a couple more shots of that in a minute. One of the problems with that, of course, is you couldn't, the, the columns were cast iron, you can't weld the cast iron. So all these shoring pieces had to be clamped on with special connections that were devised for this purpose. This is a picture just after the, uh, the major demolition. In fact, we're at the floor with the arches. You can see them in, the, in this picture. <coughs> looking out of that side um, uh, through, so that's what this would look like, minus the shot creed and the, and the finish. <coughs> uh, cast iron columns, the beams were just resting. There was no mechanical connection between the, the cast iron and the beams. That was a big problem, so the new uh, design all of this is concrete cased all the way up. Put all that together. So I also teach, this is one of my favorite slides during lectures, students on uh, <coughs> structures, and they say, you know, we just don't build them like we used to. <laughs> well, there's a rivet missing in this uh, connection here on the right, you can see. <laughs> Below grade was very complex. Uh, <coughs> the building is on a new mat foundation, five feet thick concrete underneath the whole thing. And of course, we couldn't just lift the building up and slide it in underneath. It had to be put in segments in a very complicated kind of chessboard-like uh, uh, manner. Mostly it was underpinning, digging underneath existing pieces of the structure and, and putting in new concrete. But one day we got lucky. We had one positive change order when we were to credit back to the, uh, the owner because the front of the building, this is, this is right underneath the arches. So this is what this is in the basement, below the basement. This is the excavation for the tower crane, which is a 20 foot by 40 foot by seven foot thick slab of concrete. The pilings that you see that go down below these two footings were put in when BART was installed uh, uh, along Market Street. Um, we didn't know that. Uh, the contractor was probing underneath to make sure that there was nothing below grade that was going to interfere with the segment of concrete that we were going to put in check kitting this called the shoring engineer, and they probed, they dug a little bit more out carefully, it was dangerous work, and then started discovering these, these uh, pilings. Uh, a geotechnical engineer remembered that this had been done, called BART, they got the drawings, and there you go. That was a lucky day. Um, the tower crane story in itself is interesting. Uh, to build it, to put a crane up, of course, you have to you have a big giant lay down area. So uh, to put the tower crane up to build this building, we had to shut down the uni, uh, which is not easy to do, uh, for a weekend. So the wires went down, boom, the tower crane put up, another crane came, picked it up, stuck it in place, the wires all got put back. And of course, when the tower crane came down, it had to happen again. And then a couple of years later, I did one kearney, and we had to do it another time. So I've been responsible for shutting down the uni now four times, and you know, <laughs> they who I am. Uh, this is a picture looking down from uh, the 12th uh, floor. Um, uh, from from my above. Is coming back. Oh, were you a victim of our shutdown? Sorry. No. <laughs> 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 uh, this is a picture under construction when the steel frame was uh, coming out of the, uh, the existing envelope. The bay window on the front, the original bay window, was just chopped off, so that was completely restored. Very tricky and complicated. Still tucked off. We have a second picture that was very important. Uh, besides this broadside, uh, a photo of workers on the side of the building during uh, during construction. And to zoom in where these guys are up on the scaffolding there, you look carefully, you can see a bunch of white dots on the building. These were layout um, marks that they spray painted on the building to put bolts in to attach the skin. Uh, the new skin had windows in it, and they were pairs of windows that came straight up the building, but this 
building has arches, so what were three windows became two windows. And so in the middle of the building there, these things that are kind of white kind of sticking out, those were forms that concrete was poured in to fill in and around the arches. Uh, that's why I said that Mr. Hegman could have done a much better job of making our, our life easier at the city. The famous arch was clad over with this uh, awful marble. Um, it was drilled into the beautiful uh, uh, sandstone and to connect everything. So this broadside has a picture that there was a, um, a signature that says erected MHD Young. So we were curious to see if that really existed, and in fact it did, it was behind there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Outside today. All kinds of relatively minor problems, uh, terracotta and sandstone and brick just falling out. Um, basically they cut off everything that wasn't in the way, they wrapped everything that was in that cavity that didn't need to come off, or, which was a benefit in the day. Uh, most of the uh, Metal had deteriorated quite um, severely, but it was still there. And that allowed us to faithfully replicate what was there in other materials to make molds from the actual original uh, construction. So we're glad in a hard way that they didn't just come and tear off everything. There's work that needs to be repaired. These are the layout marks that I mentioned. Now that you know the story, when you look at the building in the right sun, you'll see pattern of five bricks in a kind of regular array. And those five bricks were placed every one of these. These were bolts that were drilled all the way through the wall, concrete encased, you can see that. And then they were, we, our project came along, we cut them off, uh, and then we moved the bricks, we uh, positioned more bricks, which in fact had to go through a very careful process to match the bricks, find bricks that would be the same color and then would age correctly. Um, the biggest problem was Cleaning the building. One thing that nobody really anticipated was that a metal slip cover would dry out a building that had been on for 50 years. So once the metal was off, and, uh, and also our environmental regulations, which we firmly believe in, that it meant that stripping paint strippers and things that would be toxic to the environment couldn't be used. So a bunch of mock-ups were done to try to figure out the best way to um, get rid of, to clean the building, basically. So uh, that was worked out. So after the first cleaning, about two weeks later, the building started to effloresce. It kind of grew a beard. <laughs> <laughs> Mortar has lime in it, and when lime uh, is, uh, water's added to lime, it starts to make crystals. So this building had these little blotches of white, and more and more. And more. Eventually, it kind of looked like Santa Claus was in town. <laughs> we had a real problem. Four cleanings later, at the cost of about $200,000 each, we, which more than offset the change order for the uh, piers that were found in the basement. Um, we were able to clean the building and uh, rehydrate it, basically, so that the opalescence calmed down. And, uh, and as, you know, as you can see, the building is in financial uh, More kind of, this is what they did. Just, I remember I was asking one of the planners that uh, we were working with, I said, what are these workers thinking of when they did this? And he kind of said, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the concrete work. Remember these guys on the scaffold that were putting the concrete in the arches here? Um, this was very complicated to restore too. So all this concrete had to be removed and then masonry put in to um, uh, restore the, uh, the uh, parts that were um, deteriorated. This is my favorite question of students, you know, that little knob of concrete that's sticking out. Anybody know what that is? If you remember those forms that were on the outside of the building, they had little haunches, and that's how they got the concrete into the forms. So they just left, they cut off a little bit, and they just left it in place. So that was how they actually got the concrete into the new location. Of course, we pulled all of it off. said one of the odd benefits of not chopping everything away was that uh, accurate molds could be taken for, uh, to replicate pieces that uh, were restored on the outside. That was especially help, uh, important for the bay window. 
there was a large cornice on the um, Kearney Street side that stuck out about eight or nine feet, and that was just completely cut off. Um, the, a lot of the pieces that were uh, made were, were uh, made from FRP, a, a polymer plastic that's very lightweight, can be molded in lots of different shapes. Um, so what you see on the building now are shapes that are made of this material. This is this amazing rock <laughs> that I told you the pretty cool. uh, origins of all the materials were, were written down. One of the problems we had was the restoration of the sandstone. Uh, this became one of the best political stories uh, I could ever imagine. But uh, the original sandstone was being ordered from China. There's a company there that's kind of selling remnants of great historic buildings in Asia. Um, you get, they advertise that you can get stone from India that's been polished by like a thousand years of bare feet on it. And we, we were not comfortable with, with, with that approach. But it was cheaper than domestic stone. But then there was started to be worry about shipments and deadlines and you know, a boatload of uh, heavy stone coming across the Pacific Ocean. So the uh, facade restoration contractor Giambellini Courtney, Mike Courtney was the guy who read this, and he said, you know, um, maybe we can find the original quarry. It had been closed, it was uh, in, near Valencia, California, so he drove down there. Uh, it, it wasn't a quarry like uh, Core and Mother Earth, it was more like a stream bed with the sandstones littering about, giant sandstones. I, uh, it was owned by a rancher who didn't even know about it, and they went and found the uh, original sandstone, and he bought uh, five of these big boulders, and if, if you look carefully on the lower left, you can see him jumping off of one of the corners. Oh my God. <laughs> on the lower right is a piece of the building next to a piece of the sandstone. It was, it was the sandstone, it was a perfect match. <laughs> now, we couldn't have choreographed what I'm about to tell you any better way. There was some controversy about how much of the building we removed, should there be a tower on top of an existing uh, historic building? Uh, and does this building really qualify for the Mills Act? Uh, the Mills Act has been granted to a number of, it's a state law, it's been uh, granted to a number of buildings in other jurisdictions, but very few in San Francisco. Our supervisors don't want to uh, give away our precious money to something like this. So there was some resistance. So we had our uh, friend and supporter, actually, Aaron Peskin, here to uh, give him a tour of the building. And if you know Aaron, he's not super tall. So we have him, and, and one of the masons was this enormous man, like Mr. Mother, well, the women in my office were like, what is this guy? <laughs> so he's on the outside of the building, no repairing away, and Aaron's on the inside about a foot taller, and they were kind of eye to eye, and they just start talking about where did this come from? Are you a part of the union? I am, bam, 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 bam. And before you knew it, Aaron Peskin was testifying on our uh, behalf uh, on this project. And it's all true. <laughs> if you look carefully outside, you'll see little, they're called Dutchmen, little, they look kind of like footballs, and some of them are round. Those are the patches that the new stone was uh, uh, inserted. Um, and, and they used up the four borders. Uh, this was an incredible project. Um, we found uh, lots of historic relics when we were doing this, including this postcard uh, on the left. Um, this became a favorite because uh, another story uh, for another day. We did the building right across the street here, the addition to one Kearney, uh, which is the um, Mutual Savings Bank, which is the building in the foreground of uh, this postcard. These two projects really caused me to start thinking about new and old. I had been thinking about it in a serious way for a number of years, but just looking for good precedents for good modern design that when married to uh, good uh, historic design, the, the synthesis can really create a, a fantastic project. And whenever we talked to clients about this, we had no case studies or examples to show them. So one of the guys in my office said, well, why don't you, let's do some research. And then we did. And so once you wrote a book and Chris and I got your place, said, great. And it turned into this. Um, then did a book tour all around the country talking about it and learned that there's a lot of passion out there on this topic. 
lots of different viewpoints. In fact, I think your organization has a viewpoint that uh, is kind of a, a mark in a continuum, but there are marks along the continuum in all different ways. Um, in this particular project, we try to be very quiet with the addition, even though it's large. Uh, when Kearney, we try, we're a little bolder um, because it's next door to the building and not on top of the building, uh, and took cues from the, um, the old building, but it's really an essay in, in architectural uh, contrast. It was a fun project. It was also a survivor of the 1906 earthquake. Uh, actually, it didn't turn out quite this way, especially it turned out great. <coughs> The whole thing. We uh, restored like this the old parts. The group, well, two seconds on the story. I want to turn. <laughs> sure. Um, the Mutual Savings Bank building was built in 1902. It was the only non-newspaper building in the newspaper um, uh, angle here of this of the bank. Um, it was designed by the Roebling Company of Brooklyn Bridge Bank, steel frame. In 1960, Charles Moore, famous architect designed the corner tower. You can see right out the window there. Uh, and then our client purchased the whole thing, including the little lot next door. So uh, it turned out that the uh, 1902 building with the Charles Moore building was more of a seismic hazard than without it because it twisted it. So we added our piece as what we ended up calling a seismic bookend to uh, both brace and uh, allow the building to function a little bit more logic. And took the design cues from both Charles Moore and uh, William Curlett. Three pieces. It's a uh, one building. It's a uh, one John King called an architectural triptych. <laughs> 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 so this is the Hearst building in uh, New York. I'll close with this. Uh, this is an amazing project too. And one of the, I guess maybe you felt wounded that we were accused of you know, really gutting the building in order to save it. But really, there's no other way <coughs> to do it. And uh, they did the same thing in New York. They kept the outermost bays around the original building, in part to brace it for technical reasons, but in order to build this uh, uh, new building um, uh, up to it. There's an interesting story behind that, but I think we've had enough of the interesting stories here.